recommendations based on the disparities that we have discovered over uh, the last year. But I do want to go over some points with everyone because on our recommendations, one of the things, and you all have a sheet at each of your uh, areas, and I think we're going to share one, okay, uh, Bob Ray, and it's this sheet right here. You all should have a copy of this, okay? One of the things that I do want to go over is based on the recommendations that we have, you know, today, uh, and of course, this is in draft form, and I'll repeat that, this is in draft form, these recommendations. We need to go back and do just a little bit more homework. Um, you know, the football season's uh, here, and we're not at the goal line yet, but maybe we're on the 25-yard line, you know, we're within a goal range, but we want the touchdown, okay? Uh, we want to make sure that when we make our presentation to the mayor and council uh, in December, that we leave no reason to doubt to implement these recommendations. So we still have a little bit of homework left. And uh, again, I want to thank you because this has been a little over a year of our, our time and energy and time away from family and work that you all have committed because I know you're committed to the city and helping to improve. But when you look at this, what we want to make sure is that when we, our strategies, our recommendations align with the disparities, okay? Make sure of that. And I'm going to ask each of the committees to take a note of this. We, when you, on here, we're asking for any support organizations that can help support these recommendations. We're going to ask the committees to reach out to those partners that we're suggesting to ensure that we have their support. Uh, so, you know, the committees, y'all can break that up by your committee members, uh, task force members to go out there to reach out to those partners just to ensure that they are going to support these recommendations going forward. One of the things that I've always said, you don't want people to read about it in the paper or read their name in the paper. We need to get to them proactively versus them reactive. When we look at resources, we need to ensure that we have all the resources that are there that are, we're going to need to implement uh, any of the suggestions that we have, any potential funding, any dollars. We need to look at dollar amounts, even though it may be an estimated dollar amount, but we've got to be as realistic as possible because, again, we need to make sure that this becomes in part of the city's budget. And if it's not the city's budget, we need to look for foundation dollars or any dollars out there that can help us to ensure that these recommendations go forward. We also need to look at performance indicators because we need to make sure that we are, based on our strategies and our goals, that we have indicators in there to show that we've moved the needle, that we've moved a little bit of uh, those disparities so that they are no longer here. Uh, we've got a five-year objective that we need to look at. And we need to be realistic. We need to be realistic of those goals. We need to be realistic of those objectives. We can write whatever fancy stuff that we want on here, but if they're not realistic, they're not going to happen. And I think we all know that. And we don't want any of our work to be, you know, done in vain because we want to make sure that these recommendations get put forward. I'm going to turn it over to our co-chairs uh, for them to make any comments. Bob Ray, do you want to? Uh, uh, I'll just say, number one, thanks to everybody here. This has been a year's commitment so far. And by December, it'll be more than that. Uh, I, I, I'm really impressed with the work that everybody's done. I really am. The fact that we worked this hard so long, and we got these binders now with all this information that we've got, and it's not even half full as, as the information we've received. So thank you for all you've done. I had said early on that if this was just a show, that we would not uh, go far with me as, as a part of this process. The fact is, you have done an incredible job. The committees, the chairs, all of you. I just say thank you. We've got a body of work that will go forward. Whether the city council goes forward or not, that's on them. That's not on you. I think you've, I think you've done a great job. Yes, as Rosa says, we've got some other work to do, obviously. Uh, but I, I'm very impressed. Thank you. It's all about dotting our I's and crossing our T's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry.
September. As you know, we modified the six-day uh, leadership engagement training that was used in June with community leaders, modified that to accommodate council re uh, requests to have an option of a two-hour block of training. It's not a lot of time, but you know, we can focus. It won't be the exact same outcomes, but it will line up well. Uh, so what we're doing now is trying, we couldn't do it in August, and that is find dates at work. We're looking at September with a lot more optimism. 
Any questions? All right. Uh, assessment of disparities of, in provisional municipal services. Linda. Um, I received some recent information from NLC. As you recall, they were uh, looking at our data. Uh, there was three things they were doing in this review. One, they surveyed all city departments to see where we're currently looking at data and uh, disaggregating it. Um, secondly, they were going to identify four departments, and they did. Uh, we looked at they looked at some data from municipal court, police, neighborhood services, and the MWBE area. And then, based on that and some discussions, they were also going to provide recommendations on uh, ways we can further improve our collection and areas we might want to further explore. Um, disaggregating some of the data. Um, so based on that, they have looked at the data. They looked at it at a very high level. And as a result of that, the departments uh, are going back and looking at, is there, are there any disparities in the data? So they did it at a very high level and said, here's some areas for you to further look at. But from their review, um, what we're also going, what's pointed out to us that there are some additional things that we will be doing. And that is looking further and working with our departments to see, are there some other areas we need to be disaggregating data that makes sense? Looking at some other cities that have model programs in place, Austin, Madison, Louisville, New Orleans, which NLC has kind of pointed us to them. You know, what are some of the key measures that they're currently looking at and are those ones we need to be collecting? Are we currently collecting any race and ethnicity measures within our current databases? And do we need to be doing some additional analysis on that? So we'll be looking and working with departments to further kind of expand on the work that the task force has already done on identifying some measures and what additional measures do we need to be looking at and reporting on a more active basis. Acknowledge that uh, we do have David Cook in our audience today uh, with our city manager. So, David, thank you for coming in. Thank you. Right. On to committee reports. Uh, first on our agenda is criminal justice. Todd. Uh, thank you. Before I begin, I just make sure that I'm going to start bringing kind of what we want to address within our committee. I would highlight what your recommendations are, uh, you know, as your draft or draft recommendations are, so that we can review those, and that's what each of our committees will be doing. I just want to make sure that I was on the market before I started talking. Uh, well, as, as you all know, we're going to be having a meeting on Monday, and we're going to be looking at some of the biggest areas of the conversation for the past few months, but our first recommendation was yes, uh, our first recommendation was the creation of a Citizens Police Review Board. Um, I know there's been a lot of talks about uh, what does data support and uh, balance that also with what um, the community has requested and asked for based on town halls. And I believe, I should say I, but we believe that this was one of the most important recommendations that we could make. Um, I think actually just using a line of what uh, Ms. Johnson just said about National Leagues of Cities, they said, look at what other cities are doing. Uh, Fort Worth is the largest city in Texas. It might possibly be the largest city in the country that does not have some form of Citizens Police Review Board. And I think it's important for Fort Worth that if we want to become a major city, we have to do major city things. And implementing a Citizen Review Board is one of those things I think is important to not only regain the trust of the community, but also address a lot of the community concerns. Uh, if you look at the data that kind of supports that, uh, we looked at the arrest. Uh, minorities make up, not, African Americans make up 19% of the population of uh, Fort Worth in 2017, but accounted for 41% of all the rest. Uh, you know, could it be a coincidence? It, 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 may, it may be, but these are some of the particular data points that we looked at for that as well as feedback on town hall meetings. Um, the next thing we looked at, uh, one of our recommendations was the 
uh, bringing back the police cadet program, um, I believe, we believe Fort Worth PD is doing a great job in their recruitment of trying to have targeted recruitment of minority uh, or even uh, minority recruits by going to historical black colleges, going to the Valley, and going to certain universities that have focused in criminal justice um, uh, programs. Uh, however, it's just, it's just not being successful. I know some things that can't be quantified with the data is I think that they're fighting an issue that uh, the youth, millennials, just aren't are turned off by law enforcement jobs. And so trying to fight that, uh, that stigma, re-implementing this program to where so many senior officers uh, were a part of the cadet program. I believe former Chief Mendoza was a part of the cadet program. But one thing that we wanted to implement is allow this program to extend to the high school seniors and try to work to maybe getting dual credit uh, as a senior to participate in the program before they're able to uh, do part-time and also attend the TCC College. Uh, uh, the former program used to require that you work 20 hours per week for the PD and, and, and I believe achieve 24 community college hours for the year. Uh, previously, it used to be paid nine dollars an hour. Now, I don't know if that's a you know a reasonable amount of time, but I think that would be determined by Fort Worth uh, HR department if it is something that the city council moves forward with. Uh, next recommendation um, was I know we mentioned the diversity within the police department, but we actually uh, was recommending uh, quarterly reporting for the diversity numbers by unit by rank by patrol division, um, and the reason why we specified these is, um, I believe I have the numbers right here, that within the, the lack of diversity within the first promotional rank of the 241 corporate, corporal detective, which is the first promotional rank, there's uh, only 16 African Americans, uh, 41 Hispanics, and 10 that identify themselves as other. Uh, so that's respectfully 7% African Americans, 17% Hispanics, and 4% other. Uh, also the lack of diversity in the specialized units. There were no African American officers in the SWAT unit, K-9 unit, criminal intelligence, homicide, major case, robbery, and only one African American that serves in the special response team. Uh, now one thing to keep in mind is the challenge with having a quarterly reporting of the diversity by rank, division, and patrol division is it's a lot of data. It's always going to be changing and accuracy of it could change based off uh, vacancies, openings, retirements, resignations, terminations, and just people be uh, reassigned. Um, I would like to also thank, uh, I saw him just walk in, but Assistant Chief Krause, he's been extremely helpful uh, throughout this whole process as our subject matter uh, expert and also uh, Chief Fitzgerald, they opened the door to Fort Worth PD and didn't hold back on any data that we requested and made anything available to us, uh, as well as provo provided subject matter experts and in each particular, whether it was about training, whether it's about academy, whether about, uh, you know, I know there was an issue about G files. We actually had a meeting that we sat down and we talked about the meeting conferred and everything that the city can and cannot do with the PD by, through the uh, through the code. So we, we literally went through from being as a recruit from someone as a university to all the way through the, the appeal process with civil service. And I think because of Assistant Chief Kraus, Chief Fitzgerald, and all the other uh, uh, senior staff that made this possible, we wouldn't have been able to do such a thorough job in our recommendations. Awesome. Thank you. Anybody have any questions of time? I have one question. Uh, you know, this this is great work. You guys do a fantastic job. I, I, but one question is how how do we uh, have we considered the Civil Rights Act of 1964 along with this because uh, you know when it comes to identifying a person of any race or where they live, they're not able to you know, you're not able to make hiring decisions based upon that. And you know I. Yeah, I, I think these recommendations are fantastic, but will they be able to be implemented legally? You know, uh, I'm not going to go to the legal side of the 1964, but I'm going to address the, the issue. And I think this is one 
realistic issue about, I'm going to speak to the diversity within the, the promotional rank and the specialized units. It doesn't matter how much you try to, you know, recruit, you can't make someone take that promotional test. You can't make somebody want to be in homicide or civil rights. Uh, you can encourage it, but at the end of the day, if that particular officer doesn't want to be a detective or doesn't want to, you know, take the test, you know, there's nothing that PD can do. Now, one thing that's also kind of, that's a, uh, the other side of it that makes it kind of difficult is there's, you can make more money as a police officer just doing patrol because you can do your part time versus being a detective where you know you, if you're in homicide there's a lot of hours and the, the work life balance isn't quite there as if you do your your night shift and then you go do your part time and you have your two or three days off. So um, as far as disclosing people's personal information, uh, I don't want to tell them. I don't know how much they like that. <laughs> Here or there, but we was able to see the diversity in the PD. So let me answer that a little bit to help you. Yes. We keep demographics, so that much we know. So if we know your name, you probably know the rest, whether you're female, male, uh, where you live. Um, so all of these, uh, thanks to Fernando, are being sent to legal to vet just so that if there are any questions about legalities, be it from criminal justice all the way to transportation, legal gets the opportunity to say this may be a legal problem. So we are looking at that from a legal perspective. And um, so goals are never a bad thing. Um, saying um, you have to choose this person or you have to interview a person of a certain race or gender will get you in trouble, yeah. but actually having goals and, and, and really one of the recommend, the third recommendation, which is to do a, a quarterly report, has you looking at demographics because the one thing you should never um, be, um, be accused of is ignorance. And so that way you can say, uh, you know, if, even if this is the way it looks, it allows you to know that that's the way it looks so that no one can say, oh, we, we just didn't have any idea that we didn't have a woman in, in SWAT or we didn't have an African-American in homicide, that kind of thing. And so that's never been and, and one thing I'd like to add, I know uh, initially when we were thinking about it, it was more like annually, but I think Walter brought up the good idea that making it quarterly so you're not kind of just rush against the deadline, but you're being intentional kind of knowing your benchmarks each quarter to kind of know where you're at versus, you know, you come to the end of fourth quarter, it's like, oh, we need to move some things around before we have to report. Are you also looking at who is applying to these or people who are in those positions, but are we looking at so many applied and no one is in that position? So. Uh, you know, not particularly, like I can't say officially that we, you know, pull the number of applicants, but I think in conversation there, there was a, I believe there was a, there was a homicide, Position that came open and only two people applied for it, if I'm not mistaken. One, one person, and then there was a sergeant in narcotics that opened, and I forget how many, but it's just a lack of interest in applying for the openings. Uh, if I remember from conversation, the sergeant position was one of the most highly sought after, sought after position in narcotics, and it just didn't have as much interest at all. But I think that's something that we could look at is the number of applicants as well, because I think that kind of helps show is that, you know, more than that. And I'm just curious, how are we, how are people knowing, how do the offers know that it's open and the position is open? Are they advertising it anywhere? Does everyone get to I'll let someone before the PD is Oh, well, I'm Assistant Chief Charlie Ramirez. Yeah, we do, we advertise in postings prior to any opening. We also implemented a, a kind of a uh, uh, get a feel for the, the division. And so you're allowed to come and talk to the members of the unit to find out, kind of like an open house. And you're invited in to say, this is what your responsibilities will be. We do have detective and training positions sometimes when, when someone's maybe interested. And if the personnel allow, we will send them to the unit so they can start learning from that. So encourage them for the next time. But like you said, Ty said, we had the homicide position and historically has been very one of the top premier positions in the department and we had one Hispanic male apply for it and uh, he got it. Uh, but again, it's, it's 
one of those things, do, how do we incentivize those positions? Do we do uh, you know, incentive things to, for other people? Because again, like Ty said, they're called out all hours tonight, and some officers aren't willing to do that anymore. So, but yeah, we post them and we keep that posting usually open for 50 days. And uh, I don't know if a lot of units, they go and actively recruit. So they will call the Hispanic that they need, and they will call African Americans folks to, to apply, to, to, to encourage them. Uh, and again, it's, uh, it, historically it wasn't like that. There's some of the good old boy system, and sometimes, you know, you heard through the grapevine that someone, someone had this position. But now we, we've changed the way we, we post, we change the way we even do the interview positions, where we, the makeup of the interview board has to be diverse. So again, we're, we're trying to make sure that it's a fair process. I know in my interviews, I send my sergeant down to those interviews, and he sits in there just as the eyes and ears for me to make sure the questions are fair and make sure the process is fair. And I think most of the other ACs uh, do the same. I have a, just a couple of recommendations. As I read through this, one of the things that I'm sensing is that we're talking about the way we do it now. And if we set goals for uh, increasing the diversity in all those ranks, I think we set the goal. And then how they're accomplished, goes back to the staff to make it happen. And some of the things they're doing will work, but what we haven't heard is going outside the community and advertising, going and, and hire somebody from another police department maybe at that rank. I don't think that you have to go through the system to get to a certain rank. And then if you have two candidates and they're both equally qualified, then we should go to the diverse candidate. Because if we're really trying to diversify those positions, then we have to be more action oriented than we currently are. We gotta think, we gotta think totally different. And if it's important, then we should take that risk. And if it isn't important, then we need to leave it alone. Now, I, I, I may be mistaken in, in, in this, but as far as some of the promotional, it, 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 it goes to the highest test score. So if there's six detective spots, it's gonna to go to the six highest scores or the six sergeant <coughs> positions. And I don't think you can deviate by by uh, demographics because I think you need to confer contract requirements to go like that. Well, that does that mean to confer contract? Actually, the city is a 143 plan and under chapter 143 of the local government uh, code, it sets how we promote. So under statute, the, the meeting confirm can override it to some extent, but it, part of being a civil service city is that that's one of the requirements is that for most um, for most positions, you test into that position and there's a list based on um, the task. Captain has a little added in, um, wrinkle they have like an interview, and then for uh, commander, they're all appointed, and so um, they don't have to be tested, but for the vast majority of promotional positions in the city, uh, in the PD and in fire, have to be tested. But see, that we're never going to get to where we want to go, if we, because how are you going to diversify the ranks, the leadership of the, of the department, if you're locked into just hiring within the department? See, I think one, one thing How are you going to get there? One thing that I think you, you can't see, and you know, and this this is just to be fair to to PD. You know, when you look at the last five police academies, they they've been more diverse. I believe there's like 30 percent African American, 30 percent Hispanics, and then there's also a balance between male and female. And so that process until you see them on the street is almost like a two-year process. It's a two-year process from when you get the applicant to they get through the academy. And in order for them to promote to that first rank, there has to be another three years. So you're looking at almost five years before you go recruit someone today, you know, to build a diversity before they're actually eligible to, to move up. And that, that's just based off the, the years of requirement. Uh, I think, you know, to be quite frank, I think it's gonna take a lot of the POAs encouraging their minority membership to want to take those tests and move up uh, and want to you know, be the face. But as far as the, the senior staff, I think you see, you see a more diverse senior staff uh, with Chief, Chief Ramirez and other assistant chiefs. But then you also uh, look at internal affairs. I believe internal affairs got completely uh, uh, reorganized within the last two years or 
And so there's, there's a lot of new faces in there from what there originally was. As far as recruitment, there's two, uh, two African-American officers that are the recruitment officers that go to do, that are the face of Fort Worth PD when they're going onto campus, when they're going to New York, when they're going to the Valley. Um, it's also the, the resource officers at the schools. Um, we met with a lot of the neighborhood police, uh, neighborhood police officers as well, and that's a diverse makeup. It's just the total body of numbers you hear you don't have as many to, to pull for. If there's a thousand officers and you, you know, hypothetically only have 20 African Americans and 35 Hispanics, the, the, the balance just isn't going to be there because you're, 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 you're dead on arrival just off the sheer numbers. But it's, 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 a, lot, it's a lot longer process than what I would have thought going into it. But the problem is still there. The perception in the community is that the leadership needs to be more diverse. And, 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 and given the current constraints that we have that I've heard now, we're not going to get there this way. So the challenge becomes then how do we get there? Because if we're if we're bound by all of these rules, no one can go outside and recruit into those promoted positions, then how are we going to diversify the leadership? We've heard nobody's interested because of the, nobody's interested because of the hours, so we've heard all the reasons. But then how do we how do we get there? We need to bring forward with a recommendation that we get there and then the staff, the leadership within the police department need to figure out how to get there. Because it is real, it's a real perception among all the people we've been talking to that we have no diversity in the in the ranks. And just putting just having it at the top level isn't good enough because those individuals can only do so much within that 1,200 or 1,500, whatever number of officers we have. So why can't we put something in place where we go outside? If nobody's applied internally, why couldn't you go outside and get some recruits for those leadership positions? We do it for the chief. Again, I think it's because you're bound by law. So the chief position is a civilian position, believe it or not. And because it's a civilian position, you are allowed, state, state law allows you to do that. So without a, a, without a state law change, you really are looking at a, a longer term process that you really are going to have to start at the recruitment level. And then from the recruitment level, build upon that to the promotion level up to the change, yeah, it's longer than five years, I would argue. Yeah. I would say that so, it is the city of Fort Worth, you know, the session starts up next January. Is the city of Fort Worth willing to amend the statutes? Statutes change. They, they're not there in perpetuity. They can be amended. We've done enough where the city knows what's going on. I'm not just talking about police. We need to be talking about fire in every department that the city hired, from the water department and on, that there should be diversity. We've done a job to make the city take a look at itself in the mirror. And again, the mirror is not just to reflect what you see, it's to correct what you see. And we're trying to get this so it is correct. And I agree wholeheartedly with uh, Ms. Biggin that how do we get this? We can't just say, well, the law is. Well, the law was Bob Ray will tell you, I've known what the law is, and we certainly were able to change it the next session. So the city of Fort Worth has got to be willing to go to Austin and make some amendments to the current statute. I think what's hard about that, and I, I, it's not, I'm not disagreeing with you, Corey, but I think it's, it's not just Fort Worth who's bound by 143. It's any other city within the state that's under 143. So if, 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 if collectively, if the you know, municipalities but you know, if Fort Worth wants to take the lead on changing it, I mean, you know, I think that's that's great. But Stat um, statutes are written that are only for one particular city. They will go by population who is not more than and not less than with a number of man-made lakes. They get so finite that they can craft it for this particular city. Is the city willing to go to Austin? To make that change, like Ms. Biggins is saying, we can't, let's not just keep doing business as usual. It can be done. Is the city willing to do that to make it work for Fort Worth? That's not a question to you, but <laughs> question. What could that be part of the record? But it doesn't matter how hard the leadership tries to get 
try to diversify the ranks, they can't do it because they're tied by the same thing. And so to hold them accountable to make the change isn't going to work in our current situation. So we have to request that the situation be amended, amended in some way. And I'd like to see that as part of the recommendation. All right. Any other questions at time? Charles, Economic Development. So the first disparity that we were looking at in the Economic Development Committee was employment status, the unemployment rate amongst whites, African Americans, and Hispanics. So our first uh, recommendation relates to that area of job training, transportation to job, background issues, and hiring process. So there's a lot there, but all of these issues uh, relate to one another. And many of them rely on working with partners, whether it be the ISD, whether it be uh, College, um, Training Metro. Uh, and you can see the, the seven specific actions that are listed here. So, working with partner agencies to improve outreach to surrounding job fairs and job training opportunities. Uh, working with our partners to identify the areas where there are labor shortages and to find ways to increase the, the training opportunities for these careers. Uh, in our committee, we talked about encouraging employers to not uh, to ban the box, so to speak, and, uh, for the persons that have been formerly incarcerated. We have it listed as expulsion clinics. I think that's expungement. That's uh, the right, right term there. But that's, it's been successful. We want to see that expanded. Um, and the warrant forgiveness uh, as well. So we know transportation, we have jobs in, in our community, but they're not necessarily adjacent to where our pockets of high unemployment are. So we would like to work with Trinity Metro to determine if there are additional ways we can get public transit uh, to provide transportation to those, those jobs. Um, Talk about the incentives here, but also in our next recommendation to bring jobs to low-income areas. The last one was to try to avoid the process of screening applicants out uh, before they get a leg up, before they get into the process really by uh, screening out by race or ethnicity. Um, and so maybe uh, Describe a number instead of a name as the applicants move through the process. So those are those set of recommendations. Can, can I ask you a question? First yeah. of all, thank you very much. I, I've read this with keen, with keen interest. But my question is you write in a recommendation to the incentives policy. Have you identified what those exact incentives are? Because to incentivize projects, is a great sort of statement, but if we're going in front of uh, you know, business leaders who are going to the county, uh, what kind of incentives are we suggesting? So you're, you're on the recommendation number two, right? Yes. Okay, so that deals with our economic development incentives, tax abatements, tax rebates, those kinds of things to make sure we're incentivizing the highest priorities of where we want to get to for people that have a project, whether it be uh, building an office building, residential properties, commercial, whatever, if, if they're asking us for incentives, I understand, that happen. I understand what incentives are. I'm just saying I think we should, if you're going to put this in here, I think we should be a bit more specific in what we're going to, or what we're recommending <coughs> be offered to those uh, firms or to those companies or to those uh, whatever it may be. To just say incentives, in my view, and I could be completely wrong, you, you know this better than I do, but just to say incentives is not going to uh, move someone forward. We'd like to know what, and I would take it that the city council would like to know what they're going to have to be 
uh, or suggested to be offering someone else for two years. But it's the idea of the more the more you do, the more you get. The wages that you're offering. If you can get above the median more. And I don't know, Robert, you negotiate these can how specific can we get? Yeah, well I think when you talk about incentives, I mean, the tools really are what you mentioned, it's the tax payments, tax grants, it's TIFs, things like that. So really, it's, it's those specific tools that we utilize to bring companies in. And what I think we're trying to get to in that particular line item, as Shaw said, was if we're going to incentivize these companies, could there be something that we could potentially layer into those agreements that would tie itself towards addressing that unemployment gap we're trying to hit? So, you know, could there be additional levels of incentive that could be reached if your uh, employer participation levels reach a certain point? That's something that we're trying to think through and consider how that would work. Well, then my, then my suggestion would, would be, I'm trying to think if this is someone off the street or someone simple who's not a businessman like myself, reading these recommendations, and then yes, it is a draft, they're going to ask themselves, what are those incentives? Just to put what those are right here, what you mentioned, would go a long way to appeasing uh, someone's mind about what, what we are offering or what we are suggesting. We can certainly do that. Thank you. I had a recommendation or a question about recommendation number one. I'm sorry I didn't realize what the email was about. But on the, um, the one where we talk about the unemployment rate uh, and that it would be the same as a success measure, I wonder, I wondered about how are we going to get to uh, goal setting for people of color? Did you have any discussion in your group about that? How we're going to change that? Same conversation about if they are equal in their preparation, can we set some targets for engaging people who are who we're trying to engage to change the numbers? And it's not addressed in in this one. I'm looking at a success measure, looking down a bunch of uh, recommendations for number one, page there. Was there any discussion? Is my question, Charles? I mean, there, there wasn't. Was, there was not <coughs> no a particular number uh, suggested. So we talk about the unemployment rate, and we talk about the disparities that are, that are currently there, and how we want to encourage you know more hiring of people of color. But we don't talk about how we're going to set the goal for. Well, I think implicitly it would be for there not to be a disparity between. Whites have to get American and Hispanic. So if the white number is 4.2%, that's what would be citywide. Okay. I'm not sure 4.2% is a great number, but at least that would be where there would be no disparity if all groups were at that level. Uh, yeah, it's a, and, and the, the comment is the application percentage and, uh, and the applicants that move to the hiring stage will not show sure ratio bias and not sure how we're gonna track that. So, I, I just think we need to look at that one a little bit more. I'm sorry, Josh. Hey, it's a great job. I uh, don't really have a question, but I just wanted to point out the Board Forgiveness Outreach. As a part of our uh, committee, we met with the municipal services, and I just wanted to point out the first year, 2016, they only got 600, 600 warrants taken care of. This last year, it was over 6,300. That they say it's just because of the change of the name from warrant roundup to warrant forgiveness. So, just want to highlight change makes a difference. The third recommendation dealt with capacity building for minority owned businesses. Again, looking at the disparities. Uh, the size and the number of minority-owned businesses in Fort Worth is relatively low. Um, so these were trying to come up with strategies to help us get more minority-owned businesses and larger minority-owned businesses. Um, so we, we, I think we've talked here a little bit about implementation of the mentor-protege program through the Economic Development Department. We've got Olson Promise, that's number two there. Um, 
And, I, and we're doing many of these things already in the economic development department, but they would be uh, expanding, emphasizing, trying to do more. A lot of this is based on construction. We uh, let's not forget professional services or uh, retail on there as well because we like on both of those as uh, also the growth of business. I was a little. Um, I was encouraged in, in seeing that there was some conversation about pulling people together to bid contracts. That's what. That's how Dallas has a leg up on us. They get together and they will bring in four or five smaller people and they'll go and bid the job themselves as money. And I think that's where we have the opportunity. It doesn't matter how many uh, meetings are held by some of the um, chambers. If you don't have groups that we can pull together uh, to look at a project and how can they come together to be in that work, we're not gonna we're not gonna make any gains there. So bonding is one thing and then grouping so they come together as one, and then they can get some of those bigger contracts. And Rosa, I know some you know what ventures, I'm talking about. Some joint ventures. Joint, yeah, yeah venture joint ventures in together yeah, they, yeah, and, exactly. and put some skin in the game and then go for those contracts. They're doing more of it on the Fort Worth side now, but with my airport hat on, I can tell you, Dallas is beating us up bad because they have long ago figured out how to put things together and, and make these minority businesses stronger. And that's what we have to do. I don't know that it comes from the chamber that we go and approach that, or if it's somebody that's project managing that whole process, Mr. you know, Sir. and they can they can manage that themselves, and you hold them accountable to pull these groups together, and then bring in the airport and some of the bigger businesses so they can grab those contracts. But well, we've got some serious works gaps here. The airport quite a bit. I, know, I um, keep sending them over here. But they don't get the contracts, and probably may know more about that. But, but I think you know, in that way, we might need just a project manager to help some of the smaller minority businesses to get to get better organized. Mr. Stern, are you all encouraging that? Yes. In a lot of ways. I talked about that last time. Yeah. So one of the things that we're doing, and to the little bit to your point. Uh, we've been having a lot of meetings with both our minority firms and our larger uh, general contractors. And the one thing that we've kind of heard consistently across the board is, one, our, our GCs don't know minority firms. We don't know that they're out there. And so, as you all know, in, in construction in particular, it, it's, a, it, it's a relationship business. And if you don't know someone, you are hesitant to enter into some contractual relationship with them to do work. And so, the one thing that we've been trying to do for the past year is really make those connections the GCs and our minority firms. So one, just make sure that they have that relationship. So that's the start. The second piece of it is this mentor protege program where we have, uh, the city is working with uh, specific contractors. We want to have about five that we're going to start with. And they are going to really work with our smaller firms, mentor them, help them understand what they need to do from the bid process. And our goal is that those relationships that we build will eventually turn into joint venture opportunities so that they can bid on some of these Contract. So it's a it's a incremental process that we're going through, but that's exactly what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Tom. It, it, I'm not sure if, if this falls into the same thing, but I know the Arlington and their Chamber of Commerce and City, they implement, I think, is 30% of their contracts have to be minority owned. Does the city of Fort Worth have yes. something for yes. you? It's 25%. Mm -hmm. well, that's that's also a minimum. That's a, that's a minimum. You know, they haven't achieved. Uh, Robert? Y'all have achieved it, uh, 25% on uh, some of your Yeah, budgets. overall, so we have, we have what's called the 25% aspirational goal. And that 25% goal is comprised of construction component, which is about, the last numbers I saw were about 18%. Professional <coughs> services on the African American side, which was about 34, 35%. And then the SBE, which is the Race and General Neutral uh, designation, I think that was somewhere around 40%. So, What's, what's happening is while we have a 25% overall goal and we're hitting that number, it's really being driven by the fact that we're kind of knocking it out of the park on the SBE and professional services side on the African American uh, portion. So the piece that we're still struggling with and being challenged with is that true construction percentage where again, we're about 17, 18%. So those, that's why some of the focus, we didn't really drill down on professional services so much because we're, we're really hitting those numbers. So if we're gonna 
spend some time on this. We really want to make sure that we're diving into the construction piece of it. And that's where we have to be. Right. And there are certain mix codes that where we may not have minority businesses in, so we need to encourage them. You know, people, if they're looking to start up a business, that these are some areas that we are lacking, you know, representation on. Is that minority slash and women-owned businesses, or is it just minority covering women-owned businesses? No, women-owned businesses, we do not have a WBE portion of, of our uh, ordinance. When are we going to get it? When are we going to get it? Well, so we have a minority woman. So, oh, okay. yeah, yeah, so minority women, yes, but they would call under, under MB. Okay. Uh, under but our last disparity on, study, yeah. That was also based on your last disparity study. Correct, correct. And there's a new disparity study we'll coming in, so we'll have to look at numbers. But to Todd's point, uh, Arlington just passed their goal last year. And with their new project out there, they've already met it. Maybe. Yeah, well, but Arlington just adopted an MWE policy where the city of Fort Worth has had theirs for many more years than Arlington Right, but I'm, I'm saying Arlington achieved theirs in one year, and well, we've been doing it for 25 years and haven't achieved Maybe we need to raise it from 25% to 30%. Well, you have to understand, Arlington has an MWE policy, not an MBE policy. So if you look at those numbers, WBEs, white females, make up about 40%. So we just have to keep that cognizant. That you're stri strictly dealing with ME policy, and that's based on the spirit state. When we look at the uh, construction piece, of, how do we count the set performance? Do um, we count that in our big number, or do we allow it? Is it outside the number? Set performance is outside the number. Outside? I, I, can check. Okay. Well, well, I was going to say, I was trying to keep quiet today, but one of the things that uh, we're talking about all this yeah. stuff. You're talking about joint ventures and getting teaming and everything together, and all that is very important and it's good. But the whole thing, and you talked about their relationship, but the whole thing relies in the hands of whoever that person is that's evaluating and approving the contract or agreeing to take the contract for them. That's where it is, in those people's hands and nobody else's. And so unless that changes, the representation's not going to change. And so that mindset has to change, too. If they're looking for minority contractors to bring minority teams in, who's on? Is there a because otherwise it doesn't change. No. So each individual department that puts out bids for contracts, there's a, there's a project manager and there's a team that assesses those bids as they come in. Now, the MWB piece is part of that, so we can sit in on those uh, on those bids reviews, and there's a certain portion of that overall grade that's tied to how they meet the MB component. But it, it truly is the, the PMs of the specific departments, DPW, water, uh, parks, uh, typically that, that have those bids and they actually do. My point is, how do you break that relationship when they've been in existence for so long and you keep going back to the same vendors? That's the partnership that you talked about. And so how does a new partner ever get back? Right. So, well, so my answer to that was we're encouraging. So one, if, if the PMs are looking at the same types of vendors over and over, and I'll agree with them, that's, that's an issue well, that we've seen. We so both how do we right? So how do we how do we kind of break that issue? Part of it is getting those vendors that, that they're using that there's a relationship with to encourage them to utilize some minority firms and help to kind of build that and get that relationship going with the people. So again, I, I understand what you're saying because there really is some issues that we have to address. We've been, we've been through it, so and make sure the PMs are diverse themselves. Correct. Yeah, I, I think they're there's a lot. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah. All right, next, uh, Bob on education. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask Arturo uh, to uh, articulate our first recommendation and then Sarah on our second one. So, Arturo. Sure, I'll be glad to. Thanks, Bob. Uh, the two disparities that uh, I'll present today uh, was focusing on the high school graduation rates. Uh, the dropout rates remain a persistent problem amongst African Americans and Hispanics. They remain lower than those of whites and Asian Americans. And those that do graduate, uh, the preparedness for college and career is just not there. And so the high school graduation, rich high school graduates entering the workforce are unlikely uh, ready for the demands of many of the jobs and are unable to qualify for positions that require post-secondary education. And so the recommendation uh, outlined today and how we framed it revolved around service learning. And so to kind of put it in context, uh, the National Dropout Prevention Center defines service learning as follow. Service learning connects meaningful community service experiences with academic learning. 
This teaching slash learning method promotes personal and social growth, career development, and civic responsibility, and can be a powerful vehicle for effective school reform at all grade levels. And so part of the National Dropout Prevention Center focused on four general categories to address uh, high school dropout rates. And so those four strategies revolved around foundational strategies, which, which talk about early systemic approach, and the ISD is, is doing some of that work and some of the program to address that. The second category revolves around early interventions, and I believe our second recommendation will address early childhood education, early literacy, and so forth. The one that I'm going to present next is going to focus on basic core strategies, uh, and that's where our recommendations is focused on. And so the strategy within the report reads, uh, the goal is to adopt high quality civic engagement as an effective strategy and a collective impact approach to improve college career and civic readiness in Fort Worth. Adopt and apply service learning as a high impact teaching and learning strategy to generate multiple positive outcomes from academic performance, level of engagement, level of civic involvement, employment opportunities, and all which contribute to college and career readiness and improve the dropout rate. So in a nutshell, the ultimate result should increase uh, classroom participation issue to um, address uh, academic performance and the main focus is high, high, uh, higher retention. And so the, uh, the, first rec the first recommended action uh, to address high school dropout rates, uh, again, aligned with these core strategies, is to focus on the K-12 grades uh, for Hispanic and African American students and identify and create as necessary certified civic engagement programs and out of school time learning, again, things that we can get back to, uh, from the city standpoint. Uh, these programs should include, should increase academic skills and address social and emotional abilities as well as relationship development variables that contribute to graduation. And so the key focus uh, for this recommendation is that civic engagement program should focus in minority majority areas and focus and reflect on one of the four key pillars of civic engagement. And to kind of just codify this, the four civic engagements revolve around empowerment, sharing, building and leadership development. So we quickly just define some of these empowerment that we mentioned and tutoring, service learning, as well as sharing, anything from back to school program, providing clothes and things of that nature. And then of course building, uh, we do have a housing uh, uh, section in, in building, gardening, assisting house. So those are some just some high highlights of the respect to civic engagement. So the next uh, action for college and career development again leads to managing and improving the overall instruction. And so the college and career development uh, focuses uh, within ISDs and higher education institutions to identify, expand, or create as necessary resources that connect students to school and community resources that help them overcome barriers and ensure a successful transition from high school to college or a professional career through guided pathways. And so the focus then could be on some existing programs that currently uh, Fort Worth ISD has, which is called the Ghost Center. That's just that what I described. Uh, and maybe adopting or adapting the existing Ghost Centers into something like a welcome center, which is a little bit more broad and more, more expansive, but focusing on key neighborhoods, uh, specifically in African American and Hispanic. Uh, and, and at this welcome center, will connect city, school, and nonprofit and business community resources uh, and have that access. And so those are the two recommendations, uh, recommended actions. And one way uh, that we can accomplish this is through our uh, resources portion of the, um, of the recommendation would be to organize a college and career civic readiness. And the, the recommendation then is to identify and convene 75 leaders from these different areas, from the K through 12, higher education institutions, and then these community organizations. Uh, and then again, these community organizations could fall in a number of areas. Of course, students and parents, whether they're students, uh, school at home, but also looking at places of worship, looking at the media, looking at our libraries, looking at other community agencies, workforce organizations, uh, you know, business, for-profit, non-profit, and, and try to clarify the above recommendation to address the high school dropout rate of early college and career readiness. And so within this summit, uh, give an overview of those two recommendations as well as uh, through that through that summit create uh, these task force, these subgroups that focus on some key areas, specifically on civic readiness as well as on service learning and then of course a collective impact because this is a big undertaking that will require comments all day from all different areas. And so um, in the report I describe an estimated cost of what um, it would uh, entail to put together a summit of uh, this caliber and again identifying uh, some key um, lead organizations
graduations, we're going to look at the local two-year, three-year college, the kind of college, and an option also some four-year institutions. But again, looking at some um, chamber of commerce as well to be involved. And so that entails my report in regards to uh, addressing high school graduation rates and college and career uh, readiness. So, good questions. And if, uh, Bob, did you have anything else to add before? Thank you for all your work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you love it. Has there been any conversation on adult educational literacy? Uh, one of the things that we found on the health committee, we met with some of the community health workers, and they mentioned that when they go out into the community, they have these fairs, they have information, they have brochures, but there's a population that do not even receive. And actually, he said black men do not take the information, and it boils down to that they can't read, and they're embarrassed about that. So is there any focus or any conversation at all on adult educational literacy programs? Uh, that's definitely one of the layers, and that's where the hope would be and, and the belief that this summit would help address some of the issues that would arise where they can help define some of the framework, um, but also it has to be very specific to forward needs. And if that's one of the needs, then that would be one of the focuses for the summit. So it's, it's one of the layers, absolutely. So I'll definitely note that down and include it in the, re in, in the request. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you guys very much. It's a very in-depth work. Uh, as a uh, father to two who have graduated high school, one just entering grad, uh, high school, um, if you go into a lot of the high schools, the, the, the counseling offices, you'll see a lot of different banners of colleges, and then you'll see some pamphlets for military service. What is lacking in many of those is probably the key component in the society we live in today, and that is that career training, right? Whether it be on computers, whether it be with HVAC or, 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 or anything else. Is there a component, or can you put in a component of resource, putting together a resource material so that the counselors who are working as hard as they can have that information to, to give to a student because, you know, a plumber is going to make more than a Harvard graduate who studied philosophy, right? And we want, it's just, a, it's a fact of life. And we want everyone to be able to go in whatever direction they want. But if our counselors don't necessarily know that, we can't direct people to those resources. And I think we're losing out on a lot of great skilled, and technical uh, workforce because we don't have those that knowledge to give or to provide to our students. Sure. We have a lot of that information on the website. We have um, tried to package it different ways, and they often say they actually have access to that information. They don't have time to read it, but we do. You know, we do have that. Uh, another new trend these days is uh, signing days for, you know, like just right. like you did for college, but for getting a certification. And I know Arlington just recently did that, and I think Burleson and maybe a few other ISDs. So I think that's another kind of thing that's bringing more attention. Like we are, and also Lily and Russ are probably in experts know this, we're hosting a big career awareness event out at AT&T on September 21st, and the schools are all invited to that. And that is a bigger trend, too, to pay more attention to the career awareness side. But you're right, there still needs to be just constant attention to getting that in folks' hands. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Your saddest statement was that they don't have time to read it. I will leave that aside for a second. Uh, but it's still, the, the student, the average student who's going into the counselor's office is not necessarily going out to AT&T Stadium. And that's my whole, my, my whole emphasis here is when he walks, he or she walks into that counselor's office, that counselor should be able to say, you know what, maybe you aren't interested in going to college. And I think you also need to tell the parents. Exactly. No doubt. 
But yeah, we're putting him on a bus. Awesome. So I'm kidding. Well, but you. I get you. I agree. Tom? <laughs> <laughs> you know, one thing that I've, I've always been curious about as far as like, you know, high school dropout right, right, uh, high school dropout rate uh, and career readiness is, is there an element to, you know, get the, get for students to get the support at home? Because now it seems like we live in a society where some parents expect the school to teach children everything they need to know about life in that seven hours. So how can we go into the communities and get a more proactive uh, uh, parents to you know, come to PTA meetings, read with their child for an hour or so, you know, to maybe address the third grade literacy rate or drop out rate. Is there any way to address that? Yeah, absolutely. That was one of the focus here was the out of school time and how can, uh, for example, the city of Fort leverage the, the community centers or the uh, libraries to that advantage you know, to, to folks on the out of school time. And that was one of the challenges that I listed on my report is the family engagement how to actively enlist the participation of families, parents, and guardians in the out of school time learning. I think that's one of the challenges that I've missed here. So to your point, that's, that's a valid affair. And so uh, my focus was the out of school time and how we can leverage those, those resources for that. Thank you. And, and Ty, our second recommendation also ties into that as well from the early childhood standpoint and engaging those parents as absolutely as early as possible to empowering them with the importance of education for their children and also for themselves. And that they are constantly encourage all students from this high. My mother always encouraged us that higher education is the way, it's not necessarily that a shovel is programmed for your hand because you are a minority. So. Tim. Yes, uh, a question for you, Arturo. It's great work on this. Uh, I think uh, education foundation and everything. So this is a, a big task. But one of the questions I have is I noticed that some of the statistics are uh, Fort Worth, Fort Worth ISD specific. Is this all Fort Worth ISD? Are we including schools as a whole? Uh, you would think including private schools, or I'm really more especially interested in our public uh, charter schools. Is any of that in here? Uh, not at this time, but. Definitely an excellent point. We yeah. just kind of got some uh, data that was brought through the forward ISD, but you're right. Because yeah. some of the other things that we looked at were um, some of these other efforts that are currently taking place with uh, the dual credit programs, the advanced learning, uh, the uh, early college high school with the center of excellence, and of course the charter schools kind of fall into those yeah. areas. And those are specifically catered to higher performing students. Yeah. And so how do we, we know those folks are going to succeed, so how do we look at the other component of the ones that are not available through the system? I wonder, is, is, there, is there a way to encourage, even at the local level, more uh, charter schools for that? So one of the uh, one of the key focuses on these core strategies is alternative schooling, and that's kind of where those fall into. And so that's definitely one of, um, could be a topic of discussion at one of the summits. I know that there's more school districts in Fort Worth uh, than just Fort Worth ISD, uh, and it may behoove us to take a look at those because there's a lot of minorities moving into those areas as well, and those school systems are changing at the diversity. So we can see what they're doing versus what, you know, find out the best practices. I was really encouraged by the civic engagement comments that you made in your, uh, in your summary here. The, um, you know, we have a lot of PTOs, the parent teacher organizations and all. And I just wondered if we if they have meaningful work and how can we push out to them the stuff that workforce is doing and all of the other um, initiatives, if you will, that people are engaged in. I think we have all the pieces, including uh, upgrading the cultural diversity kinds of materials and libraries and iPads and all of the things that are going on. I just think we haven't wrapped it up well enough. And, and if these PTOs, and a lot of them have really active parent-teacher organizations, if they can get their hands around some of this, I think we can make a difference in that. But I love the summit idea, yeah, because it pulls everybody together. We need a marketing strategy, though, to get people there. And then there's a lot of work to be done just in that. There's lots of work, as you well know. 
get the right yeah. people to, to engage in it. There, there was actually just a PTO like, conference at the gate or I think in July. Right. And I didn't know that. So who else? I mean, who need to know that? I don't, I don't think our communications are as good from a um, community base as they need to be. And one thing, you know, again, going back to when we look at supporting organizations, well, uh, make sure that we're reaching out to those organizations so that we get their support for our recommendations because we don't want them to read the paper that right. they've been listed as partner and know nothing about this. Sure. You know, to I have one, one other comment. I wonder what the guidelines are for the goal setters. I don't think they work. I think they're so dysfunctional they don't work. And, and is that really a viable product? I'd like to, you know, in some way challenge you on the Do they really work? And if they don't work, then why are we funding our kids to teach? Because, you know, they're supposed to be helping them to uh, get career information. But, you know, when they fill out their FAFSA and all of that, I don't think they're working. Yeah, uh, to your point, that was how can we expand those? Because I looked at uh, Tarrant County Colleges, uh, they have a mobile goal center. Get a little bit more flexibility that allows them to go to the uh, high, uh, school, but also to uh, community events, churches, and different areas. So that was a little bit more of an uh, expandable resource. But I did think that those are excellent programs. That's something we have to follow up. Thank you. Uh, There's no further question. Thank you, Martin. That's great. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Arturo. Uh, next is. Uh, Yes, um, I, I have the second recommendation with the Education Committee, and um, this part of our recommendation regarded early childhood intervention and quality child care. We were attacking the data on um, kindergarten readiness and the disparities that exist there, and uh, we did cite directly in the table that you see Ours is on page 28 and 29 in your book. We did use Fort Worth Independent School District data um, kind of as a foundational tool, but some of the links that are here live, they do um, cite a lot of data that are Tarrant County data um, that show the disparities that exist in kindergarten readiness between African American, Hispanic, and white students. Um, and they're very similar to the table that you see cited here. Uh, we recognize that um, African American students and Hispanic students perform significantly lower than their white peers on a kindergarten early skills assessment. And this is an assessment that's given to kindergarten students in September uh, as they enter kindergarten within the first two weeks. It's given individually and it evaluates a full battery of uh, indicators that show whether uh, the level of um, kindergarten readiness. And so we targeted a, just a few of those skills that are evaluated and that have to deal with pre-reading skills and to be aligned with the Read Fort Worth initiatives and Dr. Scribner and the, the ISD uh, and their focus on Read Fort Worth and third grade readiness with reading. Uh, and also those were the areas of the greatest disparity when you looked at all the things that were evaluated. So uh, you see that there's 27% gaps in blending sounds with African Americans, between African Americans and whites, uh, and Hispanics were 15% lower in blending sounds. In listening, there was a 7% gap with African Americans and 3% with Hispanics. Letter sounds was 8% difference uh, on both of those um, racial groups, and in the vocabulary, significant differences with African American children, 15% le less ready, and Hispanic, students 17 percent i guess you would say less ready than white students at that kindergarten entry level so uh, these disparities are kind of a sample but they were significant enough that i thought we could pull them out and, and show that, that that does exist and also the research shows that the brain is developed by 85 percent already by age four um, and so that early childhood piece is so critical. And the district has done some really targeted work with closing the achievement gap um, within those school age um, targeted areas of the district um, and all of the school districts in the county and the Fort Worth greater area and campus. But the early childhood is, is a little bit different. So that was our target area. And um, we also cited childhood poverty 
that low-income black and Latino children um, living in Texas are far more likely to live in high poverty neighborhoods than low-income white children. And again, the data, we just linked in um, to the research there because it was a large piece. And um, also trauma and the adverse effects on brain development um, with kindergarten readiness. So that was our research base. Um, and again, the links kind of provide the greater depth. Um, well, we can add some things to that if you guys feel we should. So the strategy was to address these disparities, um, basically to positive, positively impact early childhood intervention by systematically strengthening existing child care partnerships and furthering their research-based work to ensure that all Fort Worth Hispanic and African American children are ready for kindergarten. Through the use of data, best practices, uh, strategic investments, public support, and sound public policies, continue to focus on and strengthen equitable child care systems where children and families thrive. So we were, we have three basic uh, goals. They're actually listed as four, and I'm going to off the cuff just combine two of them and make them three. I'm sorry about that, but uh, that's the, I think it should be written that way. Um, or I, I guess I should say, I think I should have written it that way. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, uh, the number one area, and I, I was so fortunate to have worked very closely in partnership with the chairman of ELA on this work. And so I, I kind of start off, um, you know, talking about something that's very dear and uh, near and dear to the work of the ELA. Um, the Early Learning Alliance was founded back in 2013, and there's been so much talk. You guys probably all know uh, a lot about the Early Learning Alliance. But it was actually formed in partnership with the city of Fort Worth, so there's, uh, there's an existing bond there um, already. And they are doing such a comprehensive work in this area. They have over 50 organizations that are fee-paying members that deal with early learning. Um, they have access to all the research and, and um, a, accessibility to measurements. So anything that we do um, activate, they already have in place the ability to evaluate and measure the effectiveness of anything that we add in, uh, to their work. So number one um, was focused on improving the quality of child care. So to improve the quality of child care centers in majority minority neighborhoods. So again, targeting the, the neighborhoods where that majority minority exists um, so that we can close those disparities. Uh, and the, again, articles are cited here. Um, the top four star rating is kind of what's hoped for with child care. There's the Texas Rising Star Initiative and that organization rates child care centers. And the four star rating is almost unachievable because it's like state accreditation where people have to be degreed to be employed there. So the goal is to have child care centers come up to the TSR rating of two stars. Um, and this is what the ELA Early Learning Alliance is also striving to support with all child care centers. And so in targeting those neighborhoods, um, uh, we, our hope is to A, provide set financial incentives for child care centers in majority minority neighborhoods that will encourage lower quality centers to improve through the Texas Rising Star rating system. And again, that means to get the two star rating. Um, so that's our goal is to incentivize low quality child care centers to come up to the two star rating with TSR. That's A. Then B is to align our incentives with existing incentives that are already in place provided by the Texas Workforce Commission. They're already doing work here. The Texas Workforce Commission, they already uh, do reimbursements to those child care centers that increase their rating, and they also subsidize with families um, uh, as well that choose those child care centers. So there's already a program in place that we can just kind of add to and, and make better and support through incentivizing the actual child care centers to increase their quality. So that's the, what we mean by A and B there. And then C, uh, this is sort of a little free thing that I, you know, I'm an educator and I would do anything for this. Maybe I'm just like an easy sell. But in C, we talked about creating a City of Fort Worth designation or recognition system for child care centers to earn through accomplishing desired steps to both improve their quality through the Texas Rising Star Ranking and to ensure racial equity through um, the Annie Casey Foundation self-assessment tool for racial prejudice. So we thought we could incentivize 
uh, child care centers to gain this two-star rating and also to have their staff um, take this uh, racial prejudice self-assessment that's a tool that's been successful as a reflective practice um, where organizations want to attack the racial, I mean, racial prejudice, really, and kind of be reflective in their practice. So this is a tool that's been used for that very successfully. So we thought if child care centers can take these steps to improve in these neighborhoods, their services, um, that we could say, hey, you can be a City of Fort Worth Gold Star Child Care Center and Mayor Price will come out and bring a banner and ring a bell like Blue Zones. I mean, I, you know, we did anything for Blue Zones. That was so awesome to have the bell and the banner and the mayor. Yes, we would do anything. So, and there's not a lot of cost in that. So we thought maybe child care centers would appreciate the opportunity to have a status, so to speak, um, with the city of Fort Worth if they were to increase their uh, quality. Okay, so uh, then number two, uh, again, this was a recommendation that we talked about with the Early Learning Alliance, um, and uh, um, Todd Landry worked with me a lot on this as chairman of that. Uh, this is something that they feel is very, very important, uh, and that is the administering of the, um, the uh, ASQ. And so this is a test that uh, is a questionnaire. Um, and, and it's just a questionnaire that they give to parents about their children. And the ELA is already using this questionnaire. And um, number three, if you kind of skip down to number three, that paragraph, that really kind of tells what the ASQ is about. Um, and so the ASQ is the ages and stages questionnaire for two important purposes. It automatically connects any family that takes that questionnaire the database goes into the computer, it automatically aligns the needs of that child with the appropriate services, whether it's medical, child care, or intervention services. So it automatically pairs that family with those services if they take this ASQ. So it's a really powerful tool for the sake of families and for the sake of our purposes, or ELA's purposes as well, and other child care providers, it also is a data gathering tool. So it helps target and funnel different service providers to those areas, people, and places where they're most needed. So it kind of uh, serves both purposes, the ASQ. So then our A through, A through E under number two there is how can we go about implementing a widespread administering of this ASQ assessment? And it's you know through campaigns uh, with child care centers, directly targeting families in those neighborhoods uh, by maybe giving them some incentives. Uh, at different gatherings, uh, conduct targeted outreach in those communities through physicians, clinics, immunization programs, physician networks, uh, de-incentivize training of nurses and staff, which um, is already being done. If they go into clinics and train their staff on how to give it, we can incentivize that by giving the nurses um, a gift card or something so they'll come and receive training to administer that test. And then E, incentivize parents to uh, by saying, hey, if you come and take this test, you can have a gift card or there's some incentives there, just small incentives so the parent wants to. And then the last one, number four, which I think should be number three, is uh, was, was going to be a separate recommendation, and we decided to roll it into this one, and that is to create a web-based uh, information portal focused on the availability of educational resources and wraparound services that assist in decision making regarding educational support from early childhood intervention all the way through college and career. So it's basically a large web-based portal that connects families with resources at the click of a button based on their needs. And so there's already so much out there that would be really easy to pull that together. But we did include it in the proposal because it would need a little push or a little organizational structure, maybe some finances to pay for the time to make that happen. So those are our recommendations. I'm sorry I was long-winded on that. Uh, again, the lead organization would be the Early, Early Learning Alliance. Uh, they're, all, they're very much behind these goals and um, are just an incredible organization that already exists. And so they've uh, been reviewing this with me as well. The Workforce Solutions of Tarrant County and the City of Fort Worth uh, would come in for funding too. So we, of course, put the City of Fort Worth and listed several organizations there again. Now we haven't contacted all of those, so we can, you know, take or leave any, any of those names um, as appropriate. 
And then the resources section, the last part here with the numbers, um, we listed the costs um, as we predicted to be able to provide the incentives that were mentioned in the proposal. Um, incentive payments, like just a cash payment, um, we proposed if a child care center would increase to that two-star rating, a $5,000 cash incentive to offset the cost of the improvements, which would be uh, you know, training, maybe facilities improvements and things like that. And then to keep and maintain that trajectory, we thought 1500 for the next four years after to maintain that uh, two-star rating. So uh, that would offset the cost of the higher quality. And then there were other costs there listed, um, <coughs> the financial incentive payments that would uh, be increased year by year if they remained in there, the 35000 materials and support, uh, communicating marketing. There, we listed out what we projected there um, as some of the costs. I don't know if you need me to read all those or if you're looking at those. But, uh, and we, we, we agree that it might take someone on a payroll of some sort to manage the implementation of this. And uh, so there was like a part-time salary included there at 35000 of It could be a project manager, and I don't know if that could be sort of under the umbrella of uh, an organization like ELA or if that would fall under the city. We weren't sure where that would be best placed, but we, we felt like the time that it would take to do all of these things and manage the project would probably require a, a, a part-time salary at least. And then the technology support, that uh, last line item, 50000 that was um, built into that web-based development recommendation that we combined in at the end there with this recommendation number two. And so there's other potential sources we wanted to consider um, because we know that maybe the city has access to other groups that could fund things like this. Neighborhood improvement funds, tax price incentive, or free team taxes, um, CDBG funds might be available perhaps. Uh, the crime control and prevention district funds maybe are an opportunity. The consideration of feasibility of a bond referendum that may already be happening. Uh, Texas Workforce Solutions or Fort Worth Housing Solutions are already involved in things like this, so we thought that they might also be a source, potentially. And um, then success measures. Again, the data is so accessible through the ELA. There's a lot of data available. Um, but we thought a goal of increasing five of the centers that we identified. Um, and again, we don't, you know, we don't know if this is uh, enough to shoot for, if, if we could if propose more centers, but um, we thought five would be a good goal to start with and uh, five centers to come to our rating. And then if we can increase the administration of those ASQs by 20% more than what's already being administered through the Early Learning Alliance and these other organizations, um, that we could certainly easily measure the number of assessments that are given and that's already being tracked. And then um, the data table that reflected those um, achievement gaps, we, we thought if we could narrow those gaps from 27 to 15 down to 10, that that, that would be a significant decrease in those achievement gaps and early learning uh, readiness. So that was way too many words, y'all. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Charles? The first thing I want to say is whoever found Sarah for this community is <laughs> 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 star. Yeah, <laughs> really. Yeah. Uh, one the last one month we, yeah, you fell asleep. <laughs> but seriously, I, I, think, I think it's pretty well documented that early childhood intervention is the most cost effective yeah. expenditure of dollars whether you're trying to affect crime, health, poverty. So just in general, I think this is great to focus on. I've got some nitpicking on the costs and the potential areas for that. Uh, so I, I take it that all this is, uh, you're looking at as an expenditure of the ELA, not the city? No, alone. no, we threw these numbers down for the city. <laughs> yeah. So these, yes. are, these would be city dollars? Yes. But we listed some other options. That was nice, right? Yes. <laughs> Judy? Yeah, and I, the, a lot of the funds you're talking about do come, or actually, Workforce Solutions for Tarrant County. And this year, there is a huge increase for child care in the areas of quality. 
and that's actually what will be approved next, hopefully next Wednesday, by who includes the mayor, and it is to go from two-star to four-star in areas like that. The other thing is to help those who have no star become a quality center. That's really was our target. Yes, and I can tell that was in there. So there's money for that also. And so a lot of <coughs> what you're saying, and it sounds like you talked to probably Kara and, and Todd, and yeah, it's alignment. I'm just, I'll just study this some more. I will tell you to see how much we will cover with our additional dollars than what the city and other sources would be, which would be great. The other thing, just kind of for your own knowledge, is in prior years, we have had to take families on and off, on and off. If your income changed at all, we were constantly spending all our time putting you in and off the system. Now, you actually stay on for a year before that happens to you so that families can have some consistency with them. And that in itself Cut has down costs. totally helped our system and, and the child care. But we don't know exactly the results of that. Yeah, talk about the um, talk about the budget. What percent of the budget goes to child care, and what number of dollars that represents? So this year is probably over around forty million. Forty million dollars. Now most of that is for the direct is for direct child care for the working you know families are the only ones that qualify for that. And now there's more money set aside for quality, and that fluctuates from year to year what the decision is on how much to go to quality. But all three of our elected officials love quality, and so I think they're going to be in support of that discussion, don't y'all? Oh, yeah. Okay. Tim. Uh, thank you, Rosa. Uh, Sarah, again, amazing, amazing work in one month. You're just kind of blew us all away. Yeah. But uh, a question, I, I I know that there's the Report Work Program, which is new. There's been, there's been a lot of private investment in that. and. Uh, and I know they've done a lot of research and they have their proposals out and they're working on that. Is that included in any of this consideration? I mean, is that considered? It's it listed. That the Reed Fort Worth is listed a couple of times in the okay. proposal as just sort of an umbrella uh, with the ELA. Um, as you know, So it is kind of included, but sort of indirectly. Because I think the Reed Fort Worth, the, the data measurement is mostly focused on third grade reading. Yeah. And so we really wanted to target early learning because the district doesn't get to do that as much. So we thought the city could really go in and find those homes, recruit those families, match those services, and increase the quality of child care. Yeah. And even, because I know part of this is a huge push for volunteers in the community to get out and help families yeah. and, and be a part of uh, assisting families that just don't have time to help yes. the children. And uh, it just, you know, volunteerism, that's what I'm all about. Yes. <laughs> and yes. the more of that we can have in our city, the better. I think we mentioned even recruiting and training volunteers to administer that ASQ, and that could be done by volunteers. When we go to present this to the community, I think we have to be real careful that we don't uh, overlook those areas that are already in place. I know you mentioned Carvel, Carvel uh, Housing and Butler, and those places in the report, they have reading programs embedded in there. Uh -huh. So I think we acknowledge that and then talk about how we can elevate the program. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, next, Charles. Governance. Well, maybe I'm not sure everybody really knows that uh, the co chairs felt that we needed another committee rather than wait for the process. So I was given the opportunity. We voted on that last time. <laughs> so the first recommendation here goes back to our discussion, you'll we'll recall, several months back. But the looking, looking at an independent citizen redistricting commission. As you'll recall, the situation is because of a, a, a charter amendment election that passed, is it 2016? 2016. That said, we will be adding two more council districts. We have to go through the, the uh, census process in 2020, then redraw the lines. The election actually showing those new districts would be in 2023. Now, 
transparency. We were not asked to look at this. This was not part of our charge. That's one thing. The other thing is, this is where policy gets set for our city with who is on the city council, who makes that up. It almost seems a crime to walk away from that discussion and not address it. But it's a big thing, and it's, it's beyond what we can really do thoroughly here to meet our deadline. So the recommendation we're making here is that for the city to appoint a charter review task force to specifically study and make, make recommendations concerning an independent redistricting commission. So the way it's typically done is the council does this themselves, and it's only human nature that when you're drawing the lines, you look out for number one. You look out, how do I protect myself? And how do I get reelected? What neighborhoods support me? Which ones don't? There are models out there, and Austin, Texas is probably the most analogous situation to us that there is, that has recently done this, took the politics out, and as the saying goes, the, to allow the citizens to pick their representatives instead of the politicians to pick their voters. I, it's, there's no system, I know this well enough, that's going to be perfect. But I think at the end of the day, if we're serious about equity, I think this is something that deserves to be looked at. And so that's, that's the recommendation. The council appointed Charter Review Task Force to study. And there's a timeline to, that would lead up to another election, Charter Election 2020, if that's the way that you decide to go. Okay, so the other uh, two, two more recommendations in this governance section. One dealt with the mission of the Human Relations Unit. The Human Relations Unit is that staff with, uh, with Angie and the people that work with her uh, currently. And this would make that uh, unit more robust and add to their responsibilities. Uh, so restructure the human relations unit to provide early, clear, clearly designated oversight and management over the city's diversity and inclusion efforts. So we're, we're part of it is, I think our thinking was, this task force is coming up with all these great recommendations. Who, who in the city is going to be pushing to make sure those things actually get implemented? Who's going to wake up every day with that top of mind? Well, it makes sense. We've already got this unit closely aligned in mission to formally make it their charge. In our discussion, one of the things that came out is we would like for that unit, for example, to look every year in the budget process before it is finalized, to look at it through the lens of, of equity. Um, are, this is where we provide resources each, each year. Are we doing it equitably around the city? Or are we overloading? We don't, we've already seen the disparities in our numbers that minority areas of town have more than their fair share of poor streets, for example. Well, does this, this is the budget that's going forward, does it address that? When we do bond programs, same thing. Before it goes to the voters, look at it through an equity lens to say, are we treating all of the city fairly? So I know we could talk more about that if that's necessary. Angie can, can be helpful with that. Um, the last was uh, city employee training. Uh, implement a training program for all employees on an ongoing basis that looks at diversity issues in the workplace. Uh, should address acceptance and respect, accommodations of beliefs, ethnic and cultural differences, gender equality, physical and mental disabilities, generation gaps, and language communication. So that, we just want to make that built in as just a way we do business on an ongoing basis. I think I'll stop here. Any questions, sir? I'm just curious about the missions of the Human Relations Unit. That unit, sort of like you're saying, would oversee the 
like continuation of the work of the task force. So like, is that an elected group or who maintains the balance of who's on that group and what values they hold? So there's there's two different entities, so maybe that's where there's confusion. There is the unit that is the city office that does the work, that does the investigation of complaints and housing and employment and public accommodation. Then there's the commission. What they're discussing is the unit, not the commission. Okay. So there's a city employee. Yeah, the city employee. Right. Right. Oh. Angie Rush. Angie Rush is the administrator. <laughs> Thank the you. human relations unit. Thank you so much. And the idea, which is not self-serving on Angie's part, <laughs> is to, <laughs> to broaden the scope and possibly elevate the unit to department status uh, so that we would have a much broader range of responsibilities and more authority to implement your recommendations. And part of that recommendation was the hiring of a chief diversity officer. That would be their Everything they do would be focused on diversity. Would it be a standalone department or within HR? Or? It would be a standalone department. Stand 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 right. right now, it's a unit of the city manager's office. Right. <laughs> Any other questions? No. <coughs> talk about race and culture. I can uh, you talk about I'm race and culture. Tim was talking. Oh, sorry. Just real quick, I promise. Okay, Tim, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I, I appreciate the work Angie does and, and, and uh, this entire group. Yet at the same time, this was rushed at the last minute, and, and we've not really had a lot of discussion about this. Taking all that we're doing and, and putting it into the hands of, of a group that we're recommending becomes a department, it, it is concerning to me. Um, and, and I can, I can tell you from personal experience, uh, you know, as a leader of, of religious issues here in the community, uh, when I began to become involved with mayor's office, I was immediately contacted by a human relations commission saying, uh, that, yeah, what is it called? The human relations, or human, yes, commission. But I was immediately contacted regarding some things that are against my faith that they demanded that I start participating. And, and I just, I said, that's not what I'm, and I was pushed and pushed on it. And I just want to say, I, you know, honestly, I know that kind of stuff happens, but I didn't appreciate the city government pushing me as a volunteer in the community, who's a very clearly a religious volunteer, to do things that are directly contrary to my faith. So I just say that because that's been my personal experience. We all have personal experiences, but that does color my opinion. That's why I just want that to be taken into consideration. Okay. And I think it needs to be clarified that your experience was with the commission, not the human relations unit. Yes. Correct? And there's two different bodies. You know what? To be honest with you, I'm not quite sure. I'd have to go back to the emails. <laughs> but, yeah. But they're, they're, just, they're working together. So that is just, just my concern is, like she said, the values of the organization. Uh, you know, what is the agenda? Because the agenda was very, very one-sided. The agenda was counter to everything my faith stands for. And you know they're going to have their agenda, uh, but gee, uh, that was that kind of gave me a it just kind of was a bumpy start there. And then when I tried to include their organization, uh, which was the volunteer members, in what I was doing through the city, no one wanted to participate because, and I don't know why, but this, they wouldn't want to participate. And we were strongly encouraged by the mayor's office to reach out to them and have them on. And I would send them emails, phone calls, all kinds of stuff. But they, after we said, after I just like eh, kind of back off on this issue that is counter to my faith, they would have nothing to do with me. So that's just something I, I encourage us to consider because I would have trouble elevating them to a high level in the community to take all of our work and then move forward. I'm sorry, but you're not sure it's the same group, right? I have to go, it's, it's a, it, the, the Fort Worth, Texas.gov is the uh, is where where the emails came from. That's the commission. That may have been the human relations. You know, it's actually very personal. I'd rather not bring it up. Regardless, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Angie, do you know? Do you give us any feedback or? I I remember that the commission was asked to work with them on compassion for work. 
and that we were asked to support their um, work being compassionate and the initiative did. I'm not sure what, I'd have to have a conversation with Pastor Woody because I really don't know. Um, but it, it, it wasn't the unit. The unit is enforcement and investigation, investigation. and ADA coordinator and Title VI and, and so it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been staff. Well, I don't, all those four things I've got was that you know, I'm not, I don't want to get into who did what. I just I just want to let you know that after that initial conversation, there even though I continue to reach out to them to be involved for two years, every month, with phone numbers, email addresses, there was zero response. And so then I just dropped it. I just dropped it. I said, well, they don't want to be involved, and they, maybe because I'm not. I'm not, I'm not pushing their agenda, but I thought, you know, where's the partnership here? Right. Well, I'm sorry that that's happened to you. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a personal <laughs> thing, and it may be yeah. totally isolated. Exactly. Well, and that's uh, why I think it's key to know who, who did, did what. what to exactly. this discussion. It is key yeah. to know who did do well, what. Yolanda. With all due respect for the conversation, I thought we were going to be out by 6.30, and I have a call scheduled at 7. Okay. And yeah. I like to not only be prepared for that call, but I like to give my report because I didn't know it was going to run over, and our Miriam is not prepared to do it. So is there any way we can? Yes. Anything else? Charles? No. Okay. Yes. Yolanda. Okay, so uh, for the health committee, uh, for the sake of time, again, I mentioned I, I do have to go in just a little bit, but when I look at our four, uh, our four recommendations here, uh, we have education outreach, and one of the main things that I wanted to point out with that is uh, just increasing the face-to-face -face interaction in these identified neighborhoods with those community health workers, and uh, we kind of talked about earlier with the, um, the, the reading, the issues with reading and the information that they're being able to share. Uh, just been able to increase that and working on different resources and activities and, uh, uh, and, and just organize, not organizations, but uh, activities that will support that increased education outreach. So whether it's an event, whether it's brochures, whatever it is, just making sure that those community health workers are out there and are, they look like us. So right here on the recommendation on page 43, it says, you know, actually just having more African American community health workers serving in that stop six neighborhood. So that's just known because going to not only relationships, but we would assume that a black man would take more information from someone that looks like him when he's, you're talking about their health and well being. Um, so that's that one. And we really, just on all four of these, Tarrant County Public Health was really going to be the lead organization. And we do have. Um, Ann Collier, who is our subject matter expert, who has um, been very helpful, but I, I will talk to her about that a little bit more as far as making contact with her and ensuring that they are, they will be that lead. Um, going back to number two, active lifestyles, I did have a few minutes to look over the transportation recommendations, and under active lifestyles, the same thing kind of keeps coming up about the sidewalks, the stray dogs, um, the lighting, and even with the access to providers, I looked at the transportation recommendations on page 66, and those two on page 66, number three and four, would definitely support the things that we're talking about as far as access to health care for these underserved populations. And number three says, identify specific opportunities to improve transportation affordability, access, and safety for minority communities, communities through enhanced coordination between existing programs and agencies. We could actually do a quick copy and paste and put that under of access to providers for, for health. And then even number four, I would really want to look more into this one as far as I'm saying design a racial equity impact assessment tool for transportation projects. Uh, that is something that is, is major uh, just with these underserved neighborhoods. Being able to have access and we know that some of the bus stops are not in the neighborhood so even just, just, just trying to get to the doctor's office and trying to get to the clinic is a feat in itself. And uh, Miriam, do you have anything else? So I, kind of, I did kind of group that active lifestyle and uh, access to providers under transportation a little bit because that is a, that is a I don't say nucleus, but that's something that's very important that falls under uh, both of those areas. And uh, something with active lifestyle that we talked about before was the uh, equality of the equity as far as the different community centers and the different organizations in the, in the different neighborhoods. So one might have this beautiful gym 
workout equipment while another one in another neighborhood, their treadmill was in the closet with the mop bucket. So just looking at the equities with the equipment and the accessibility to the community centers. Not on top of that. Like Karen County Public Health and the community centers are kind of like happening for education and having health fairs and access to that. If those aren't being utilized in the community, they're not equitable. And so utilizing those resources that we already have in the centers and partnering with agencies like Karen County Public Health to deliver those messages of health in those areas that are needed. I, I just have one recommendation. We tend to kind of want to own health care. And what I'd like to see on this one is some thought put into once we go out and we give you your data and say you're hypertension and some new diagnosis, or we do a hemoglobin A1C and we know now that you're at six, which makes you pre diabetic, to give that information to the individual so they know where they are and then begin to let them be accountable for that. I think the reason we fail is because we want to own it. We want to try and steer them into this and steer them into that. And if we can just do more screenings and give the individual the information that they need and then hold them accountable for their own health care. I think one of the things that we didn't talk about is the community health workers, really placing some of those people who can help navigate once they do get that, that number, where do they go, what does that mean for them? But it comes down to a funding issue of if who's going to fund that community health worker. You know, the city public health used to now Is there a partnership that could be created with UNT Health Science Center? So maybe there are some conversations that can be had with, uh, to get some support from those entities to support this. So the point, the point that, uh, that I think we, we waste so much time chasing down Ms. Jones or Ms. Smith. And so all of this other stuff going, uh, and I'd like to see us put some thought into as we go out and do the school news. And uh, we've been a part of that for a lot of years. We don't chase down Ms. Jones. Give Ms. Jones the information she needs. You have a mask or you have whatever. And then maybe a follow-up call through one of the navigators to let them know, you know, we haven't seen you, but to run after that the way we currently do it, to chase them down, to make sure they get it well. Now you have to build some accountability into the individual. And there are a lot of, there's a lot of work going on in those vans. And uh, I think we spent a lot of time focusing on 20% of the people, while 80%, you know, go on and not get that service. So we saw some look on the Hispanic Wellness Fair. We did the pre and post on that to help those individuals. Good job. Thank you. Good job, Yolanda. All right, anything, any other questions on health? <laughs> Sorry, Ty. Okay. Katie, housing. Housing. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, thanks. I'm sure our other, Sarah and Jennifer do, to our staff members, Catherine Huckabee, Tara Perez, and Barbara Asbury, who are just amazing, and uh, Aubrey. Hagard has also contacted me and um, will be meeting with us on Thursday. We have our recommendations here, but we are working on refining them and filling in these other blanks, and we will be meeting on Thursday to start doing that. Um, so I'm, I want you all to jump in at any point on this. Our first, uh, one of the things that we heard again and again and again community conversations and in the town hall were affordable, safe housing in neighborhoods with good sidewalks and public transportation and safe lighting it came up again and again and again. And the cost of housing in Fort Worth is through the roof. Uh, and so it has made the availability of affordable housing even more of a problem than it usually is. So one of the things but the racial and cultural disparities to be addressed were that racial segregation in housing has increased in Fort Worth since 2010, 
45% of African American households and 38% of Hispanic households are rent burdened, meaning they pay more than 30% of their income for housing, compared to 26% of white households. Hispanics comprise 59% of households who live in substandard or overcrowded housing. So our strategy to address this is city incentives for multifamily housing should be provided only to projects that to the maximum extent financially feasible provide housing units affordable to households at 30% of area median income. And we've provided definitions for these terms on this page as well. Um, and it should apply to all city uh, incentives. We, and we've spent a lot of time talking with people, with um, the staff from the City of Fort Worth Economic Development Department, uh, the Fort Worth Housing Finance Corporation, the Housing and Urban uh, Development people who deal with their grants assistance, neighborhood empowerment zones. I mean, we talked to, I don't know how many people we've had come. Cover us up with data. Yeah. The city of Fort Worth is doing an awful lot already, but just the way we're defining things means that the people who need it the most are not getting the help. And we think that simply redefining some of these things will make a big difference if we can get people to do that. Um, and we've gone through and identified the likely opposition. NIMBY, of course, will pop its head up, uh, and, um, and the resources needed. Uh, obviously, we will be talking, <coughs> and have, some of us talked with the Real Estate Council of Greater Fort Worth, the Apartment Association, um, Texas <coughs> Association of Local Housing Finance Agencies, um, and, and we've talked about a lot of the same things that economic development people talked about, um, about a ban the box on uh, applications for apartments and for rent and help because that is also a huge barrier in obtaining housing. Um, recommendation number two on home buyer assistance. Again, the same disparities. And, and some of these, the city of Fort Worth can address mostly by creating partnerships and working with other groups. It's not necessarily thing that the city itself can fix, but it can use its leverage to encourage other organizations to step up and fix. Um, and for instance, working with lenders and realtors to adapt the city's existing home buyer assistance program. Um, and like Is I said, housing opportunities still live? Pardon? Housing opportunities? David O'Brien's group? Yes, we're still around. Yeah, they're still yeah. around. Because, I mean, that would be a plus to add them into something of this nature to help those home buyers educate, educate them. And that brings us to um, recommendation number three, which is to increase awareness of the many resources that are already out there. The city's doing an amazing job of educating people, of walking, once they get people in a house, walking alongside them on how to deal with living in a house and all the issues that brings up when you don't have a landlord to call. Um, the city outreach in these areas is very impressive already. It's getting people to know that they're available. That's a huge part of what we need to do. And again, I have just gone, I've flown through this at a tremendous rate, so uh, given the hour, but um, I cannot say enough about the, the help we've got from our resource people. And we will continue to work with them. Like I say, we have a meeting planned on Thursday to really drill down on the filling in. Because if we can't, to be crass, sell this to the city government, it's not going to, all our work is not going to do any good. You got it. Get the nail on the head. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kelly. So, do you, to Sarah? Yeah, I think we kind of captured most everything. You know, again, the focus in a lot of ways was the various different groups, but also making sure that people that are working have a place that they can afford so they don't have to commute and spend all their time commuting, that they can get to, you know, that they can live, work, and play within a certain area and not be priced out of that area. And it's all tied into economic development. I mean, the number of People have to work multiple minimum wage jobs to afford minimum 
a one bedroom apartment in Tarrant County is huge. It's and they're largely minority. Oh. So we are twins with economic <laughs> development. <laughs> Uh, question, uh, great job. Uh, question about removing the uh, pots. How do you get past like you know certain requirements, like if you're a registered sex offender and those type of parameters to live in certain houses? So, you know, how do you get around that? You I think we, I mean, obviously we have to work things like that out. A registered sex offender is a whole other category than someone who has. It was a convicted felon, has served their time, and are now back in the community. That's, those are apples and oranges in many senses. So I think we have to figure out how to make that work. Uh, because you're right, I mean, obviously a registered sex offender is a whole other category when it comes to housing. Any other questions, comments? Ben Carson was here with Envision. I'm sorry? Ben Carson came to the community and talked about the Envision program. Any mention of that from any of the housing people you've been working with on your committee? I don't. Envision? Envision. 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 I, I don't think so. Was standing out. The Secretary Carson came to Fort Worth. Right, I, mean, I, know, I know what you're talking about. I don't know that we've discussed that specifically in our committee yet. That might be something we want to take a look at and see how we can maybe pull some dollars. We're looking for money. There ain't no money. Well, there may not be any money right here, right now. But I, I think no. that case. Oh, yeah, I I thank you there. Yeah, so like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then we come to transportation. We have four goals on here. Uh, our first recommendation is to create a transportation equity policy, uh, tie that into a five-year action plan. One of the things that we've talked about is that we've got to embed an equity policy program in everything that city does, whether it's TPW, water, anything that has to do with transportation, streets, lights, everything. We've got to make sure that we're looking under an umbrella of an equity plan. And so that's one of our first recommendations on here. And as you'll see, we want to identify opportunities to improve coordination between existing programs, agencies, to positively affect transportation affordability, access, and safety for minority populations. Uh, developing a racial equity impact assessment tool to support the systematic <coughs> and consistent review of transportation programs for equity impacts across the organization. Developing education and training materials for staff, stakeholders, and the community. Identifying opportunities to utilize private pu private pu uh, public-private partnerships and public-public partnerships to advance transportation priorities that directly access equity. We are behind on transportation. I think we all know that. Uh, so we've got to look at all our areas, and we can't always just look outside the loop of A20. We have to look at our inner cities so that we can get those individuals to the jobs that are outside the loop and build the lines and so forth. We've got to find those ways of getting those individuals to better paying jobs that have better benefits for them and their families. <clears throat> Our second priority is the majority minority areas, and that's where you get into the poor conditions of streets, uh, lights, uh, missing sidewalks, the, uh, you know, one of the things, we just passed a bond program. How do we uh, prioritize these areas to get their improvements? And by them looking through a racial lens or an equity plan lens, that can help us to make sure that we are getting those streets fixed just as fast as we are in any other area. Because if the funding's been approved, let's get those streets approved as well. Because that's gonna help those individuals with quality of life. Uh, the third recommendation is after crash, um, action crash reviews. And uh, we wanna talk about identifying or institute routine after action reviews between involved agencies for all pedestrian bicycle crashes for which police reports are written. Uh, we need to be a little bit more proactive because you've got bike lanes now coming out on a lot of our streets, but you also have, I mean, I see this on West 7th because I live over here by West 7th, and I, I can't believe anybody will drive down that street in a bicycle because of the traffic congestion, but they do. And, but we also need to make sure that they're safe. 
Uh, and I know there's a lot of talk going on about the bus routes along with the bike routes and so forth. So there's a lot of conversations being had about this, but we need to make sure that we are looking at that as well. Okay. The fourth one is pursue the next generation of transit solutions. We have to build transit today that's going to transition to the future because transit will change. We have uh, virtual transit mechanisms, whether the autonomous vehicles, autonomous vans that, you know, you're looking at VIA and Arlington, you're looking at what's happening in Frisco. There's a lot of technology that's going to change transportation. Um, I can't think of his name, Siva. Uh, he came to Fort Worth South a few years ago to talk about, and he wrote a book, he's from Stanford, The Deregulation of Transportation Through Technology. And that's going to happen. So whatever we do today, we have to build the transportation of today that will transition to the future. But we also have to look at the funding. We have to get behind funding for transportation. Right now, Trinity Metro only gets a half a cent of sales tax. We need to get that raised to a penny. Uh, we need to look at other ways of funding transportation so that we can ensure that we have a better transportation system, and it's got to be a multimodal transportation system that we're looking at. Is that recommendation in We are going to be redrafting some of our recommendations and adding some things to it. I mean, I think it's, I think it's really important that we think it ought to be raised to a penny. And we may recommend where we would get that since we're already at a limit. Yes. And it could be that there could be some tax abatements or tips that are retiring, but there could be money from those tips instead uh, that are going to be going to the general fund that could be utilized in sending that money to transportation initiatives as well. Yeah, but I'm not so, raising the oh, sales, yeah, tax. sales tax. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, the crime district perhaps doesn't need a penny anymore. We could recommend that. Reallocation. Reallocation. Yeah. 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 So did I understand? Somebody had to say that, didn't they? And our, our committee is going to be meeting again as well to look at some of the things that we need to focus on and we doing our recommendations. So, you know, right now we've got uh, a few more weeks to start uh, looking at, oh, I had it here, I'm sorry. The sheet that Fernando gave us, you know, of what we still need to complete. So if each of our committees will go back and take a look at this so that we can ensure that, again, we're dotting our I's and we're crossing our T's, uh, so that we have all the information necessary. So when we go out to the public, we're better prepared, but also after that, we're better prepared when we go out to the council, okay? Any questions? Uh, Michelle, briefing on video. Yes, um, we want to put together a short video that just kind of gives an overview of the recommendations and that will be online um, when we have the draft recommendations ready to go out to everybody in September. But in addition to that, I wanted to do a more of a, not a long video, but um, something that kind of um, gets your input on this entire process and why you got involved and, and what you've gotten out of the experience kind of a little documentary. So I'll be contacting you all to come out and um, have someone come out and interview you. I'll send you the questions in advance so you're not being surprised, you can hear your answers. Um, and then we'll put that together and we'll be able to share those little vignettes online but then also have the longer video for people to see about this whole process. Because I think I think the journey has been really important and I would like to, to get your all your input on, on what that's meant to you. So that's one of the things we're going to be working on. The second thing that's on the agenda is about the, um, and I sent everybody an email today, the public um, meetings that we're going to have after the draft recommendations are accepted at your September meeting. And so um, I sent that out. There were some questions about the 6th Patrol Division. That is on Riverside up in the Alliance area. That's our far north meeting. So I will send that email out again with addresses and dates if you all could just let me know your availability. I have a sign-up sheet here if you want to do it, but it might be easier at this hour to just do it by email. Yeah, Shelly, those are 6 to 8? Mm -hmm. Time. 6 to 8. Time, it's, um, they're 6 to 8.30. 6 to 8.30. I know at least in... 
Yes, I have housing and I have, I believe I got, I got another one today. I want to say. Did you get the east side? Transportation maybe. Do we have a place for the east side meeting? Oh yes, I just got confirmation um, at 3.33 today. And um, we're going to have it at the University of Texas at Arlington Research Institute, which is on Jack Newell Boulevard on the east side. So I'll send that address out to you to everybody. It's a good facility. So the library is going to be under renovations at that time. So they're not going to be ready for it. Uh, you have a list of all the future meetings on here as well. And uh, a list of the uh, community outreaches started from September the 24th to October the 11th. So, you know, get back with Michelle and let her know when you will be able to participate. Uh, you know, participate in at least one. And if you can participate in more, that's even better. So we'll have that. Um, closing remarks. Lily, do you want to start off with closing remarks? I just think the, uh, I think the work that was done is just phenomenal. And, and I'm really grateful to, uh, to just be a part of it. Thank you. Good job. Yeah. Uh, uh, also, I want to say thank you. And you know, when we said, "How did we get involved?" When the four of us sat down, uh, you know, we, we, we looked at names. I truly feel that we are blessed that each and every one of you said yes, because I think each and every one of you are truly, I'm gonna put it in a religious sense, a uh, uh, an image of God. And together, I think we're building a better image here in Fort Worth. So I thank you, and uh, you've truly blessed all of us. And I really, really appreciate it. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all uh, for all the work that you've done and the work that you will be doing. Yes, but you all have a good evening. Bye.